Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. We'll get started on our uh, webinar in just a minute here while some other folks continue to join in. So just hold tight. We'll give it another minute or two before we get started. And I see a couple of folks still hopping in, but want to make sure that we are able to get to our exciting content today uh, and make it through all of it with uh, some question, some time for questions at the end, so we can go ahead and get started. I'm going to go ahead and bring presenters here on the screen today. So hello and welcome to the third in our webinar series dedicated to Copilot for Microsoft 365. We are recording this webinar and it will be made available on demand for you after the session. Today we're discussing enabling Copilot adoption, really specifically focusing on Copilot for Microsoft 365. We're very excited to be here, talk about what Copilot can do, how it can transform your business, and what you can do to ensure your return on investment by maximizing user adoption. Quick overview of our agenda today will be uh, recapping what Copilot for Microsoft 365 is and how it works, and we'll go ahead and dive into adoption and change management, which is really critical for Copilot success within your organization. We'll review some of the key adoption pillars we've seen related to Copilot, and then cut, touch on how you can get started. Uh, we'll leave some time for questions at the end, so please do post your questions in the Q&A. Uh, we'll be doing our best to monitor those as we go, but we definitely want to leave some time dedicated at the end to make sure we are addressing all of your questions. Quick introduction, my name is Caitlin Kelly and I'll be your host today. I'm an adoption change management consultant here at Valorum Reply. I'm very excited to be talking about Copilot because I am a self-professed Copilot geek. Um, absolutely love what it's been able to do and how to generate some real excitement for it. I'll go ahead and pass the baton over to uh, Margaret Hahn to introduce herself. Hello everyone, my name is Margaret Hahn. Um, I look after our modern work practice um, and have recently been, na been named an associate partner. Um, prior to that, I led our adoption change management team here at Reply and really excited to talk to you about all things Copilot and adoption. Great. Thank you so much, Margaret. So as I mentioned before, this is the third in our series of co-pilot webinars. Uh, if you missed the first two, uh, the first one being focused in uh, an introduction into AI in the modern workplace, and the second being focused on information security and protection, you can catch them on demand, um, valorumreply.com slash event or you can also go to our Valorum Reply YouTube channel to catch those. Um, obviously here, we're talking about enabling adoption and then upcoming in March, we will be talking about extending Copilot. So how we can bring the power of third party tools into Copilot, really exponentially increasing its value. So be sure to make sure that that March 7th webinar is on your agenda as well. So before we get started, I do want to take a minute to introduce ourselves. So we are Valorum Reply. We're a Microsoft focused consultancy that really prides itself on delivering exceptional modern work tools uh, as well as security and Azure services. So though we're particularly focused on the Microsoft stack, we're part of the larger reply group, which has over 200 highly specialized consultancies across the globe, each with a specializa specialization on a specific technology. And because we have such a close partnership with Microsoft, we've been lucky enough to be a part of the early access and jumpstart programs specifically for Copilot. And we're a qualified partner to then deliver some of the Microsoft funded opportunities like the Microsoft uh, Copilot workshop and uh, the adoption factory. So as I said, total Copilot geeks here. And we're part of the modern work side of the house, as Margaret said, uh, our fearless leader, um, really focusing on bringing these tools in and transforming the way people are working. 
And so before we get too deep into, you know, um, going into adoption, I do want to take a minute to review what Copilot for Microsoft 365 is at a very high level and how it's interacting in your system. So we know that there are a lot of co-pilots out there, right? So we have co-pilot. Uh, many of you might be familiar with the term Bing Chat Enterprise. We've got co-pilot for Microsoft 365, co-pilot for Power Platform, you know, co-pilot for sales and co-pilot for service, right? There are a lot of generative AI tools out there. Um, so Microsoft's co-pilot lineup is really extensive. Starting over on the first, our uh, traditional co-pilot, that's a little bit more of what we call kind of like the, the personal co-pilot, right? So that's leveraging the large language model and AI powered web search answers and content generation. Uh, what we've seen also when we took it over into the work version is bringing in that commercial data protection. So uh, making sure that there's sort of a service boundary around the data that you are entering into Copilot for those answers um, and uh, making sure that your data and your organization's data is secure. So laying all that down as the foundation, we then bring in Copilot for Microsoft 365, which has everything from Copilot, but then you add in the enterprise security, privacy, and compliance into the fold, uh, making sure that all of the permissions and security that you've worked so hard for to install are really respected and are helping to guide Copilot. You also, of course, have things like the Microsoft 365 graph, which of course is all of the content and the context that exists within your system, all of your data, right? The files, calendar information, emails, messages, people information that really create that rich experience. And the Microsoft 365 apps, of course, looking at things like not only Word, PowerPoint, and Excel, but uh, Teams, Outlook, uh, Loop, OneNote, Whiteboard, all of the tools that you're using every day. So we have all of that. And then once we get into Copilot for sales or service, we're also bringing in other tools like Dynamics 365, Salesforce, or ServiceNow. So as I said, a really extensive lineup here. Our focus today is going to be more around the Copilot for Microsoft 365 sphere. So as we're looking at that, uh, to get a better understanding of uh, how it's all working within the system, as we said, it uses the large language models, our M365 apps and our, M and our Microsoft Graph. The large language model is OpenAI's GPT-4, which is its most comprehensive model. And then we move into the applications that we're using every single day and combining that with the data that is available within the graph. And the graph has been around now for about sort of 10 years, right? So a really rich repository of information that is nice and secure and not giving you access to things that you wouldn't already have access to, which is one of the things that I love most about Copilot. If we were to step back and take sort of a 30,000 foot view here, um, we have how Copilot for Microsoft 365 works within your system. If you're starting up in the upper left hand corner, working in one of your applications, whether that's Teams, PowerPoint, Outlook, et cetera, you send in a prompt to Copilot, something along the lines of uh, draft me a project outline based on, you know, Project Unicorn in Aperture Inc. Right, that's a lot of information to throw at Copilot, so it immediately sends it down into the bottom left into the Microsoft Graph for pre-processing. So that's where it's going to take the information you gave it, like um, you know, Project Unicorn, Aperture Inc. What are these? How do they make sense in the graph? What does this person or user have access to already in relation to these files and this information? It's also going to take some larger context, right? So it's looking for a project outline, looking for other similar files that way. And then sends that over into the large language model. So that's where it's going to become, you know, sort of transformed from raw data um, into these tokens, which become patterns of speech. Uh, the large language model has been trained on something like three billion words. So um, really understanding and breaking things into small patterns, syntactic structures to make it a natural language response. Once it's done completing that, it sends it back into the graph for post-processing, making sure that everything is making sense, leveraging that semantic index to ensure that it all sort of um, works within your system. And then it shoots it back into the application in which you um, asked it the question. So 
some pretty amazing things happening here in the background. Um, if you've used Copilot at all and you've seen it sort of uh, think about its response for a little bit before it gives you one, just know that this is all of the magical work that's happening in the background. A lot of amazing things here. And one thing I do want to call out again, talking about security and compliance, we see that dotted line around the edge being that Microsoft 365 service boundary. So um, staying in line with your tenant within your organization, not sending out data or responses back to the large language model, not training it, really keeping it all still within the confines of your tenant and keeping your data nice and secure. So that's all fine and well, right? We know how it works. We know how it's leveraging the system. But when it comes to understanding why we may want this tool in our system, it's important to look at how our employees are performing. And the reality is that digital collaboration can be draining and it's taking its toll. As we can see here, 64% of employees are reporting that they just don't have enough time or energy to do their job. 57% of them are, uh, are they're spending 50% of their time communicating, right? So they're in meetings, they're looking through emails, they're doing chat, uh, and there's a chance that they're probably doing all of this potentially at the same time as well. And then of course, 43% of their time is spent creating. So working in your applications like Excel, Word, and PowerPoint to create documents, spreadsheets, and presentations. So. It's a lot of time spent, um, you know, working in places that aren't really adding a ton of value, so to speak. But a recent report on generative AI is really promising when it comes to those numbers. So by leveraging generative AI, we can start to chip away at some of the time consuming and energy draining activities. Generative AI in the workplace led to double digit increases in completion rates, uh, double digit decreases in time spent on those tasks. And my favorite here, an over 40% increase in the quality of responses to subtasks, right? So what we're seeing here is starting to see is this picture of bringing generative AI into the fold to leave room for the more engaging tasks, the more creative and innovative tasks. So that is really, really promising. So we understand where employees are struggling. We understand where generative AI is already improving their day. So when we bring that together in the bigger picture, we can see that in an organization, when you improve efficiency, when you leave room for the value add activities, which include that innovation, creativity, and growth, when you leave room for that, you can reduce costs. So think about the tools that you're using right now that uh, you know are activities that Copilot could accomplish. Um, you're also able to leave room for the activities that drive revenue growth by giving your employees in space to um, push the boundaries and to take your organization to the next level. So it's all a bit of a sort of a cyclical process using Copilot, driving that efficiency, reducing your overall costs and improving your revenue growth. So these are all really excellent reasons to start thinking about AI in your modern workplace, but I'm going to go ahead and pass it to Margaret to talk a little bit more about why we need to start considering adoption in this as well. Awesome. Thanks, Caitlin. So when it comes to new tools and technology, Copilot is one that is so powerful, but really requires um, adoption initiatives to be successful. So as humans, people, um, speaking to artificial intelligence is not innate. It's something we have to teach and train um, and help people to understand how to actually interact with these new tools uh, to be successful and get those double digit uh, increases and de decreases where we wanna see them. So when it comes to a uh, co-pilot for um, M365 and adoption, how do we realize that business value of M365? So to frame up our discussion, I don't want to shy away from the overall cost of Copilot. So when we're thinking about making that investment in Copilot right now, um, depending on your agreement with Microsoft, this is general. Some people might have other hyper specific things in their agreement with Microsoft, but we're looking at about $30 per user per month, excluding the implementation um, and adoption change management costs. 
when we think about that, that's about one hour per month. Um, the time M365 Copilot must save to justify the license cost for a salary um, of somebody who makes about $60,000 a year. So we really want to look at making sure that we are saving that time to justify that expense for, um, for an employee that costs about 60 k then we want to think about 30 minutes per month um, as a time that co-pilot must save um, or um, yeah f to justify the license cost for a salary of about 120k per per year and so when we think about those intangible benefits of Microsoft Copilot, um, such as creating time for innovative work that drives business outcomes, um, enabling people to actually focus on the work that you brought them into your organization for, um, even saving an hour or 30 minutes um, a day or, or, or a month um, really adds up to showing the, the benefits of Copilot altogether. So the question is, how do we prepare ourselves to get people ready to realizing the value of Copilot? How do we maximize these cost benefits over time? And we really think that change management is a key to the success. Just flipping something on and hoping people will use it um, doesn't really work for something like Copilot, where you have to actually take the people along on the journey. So let's talk about the value of adoption change management. So for me, I have been in the change management space for almost two decades. So it's something that I love. I think about it all day, every day. Um, and I really firmly believe that it's vital to digital transformation, really any kind of transformation. But when, when we're thinking about technology, it's really that people side of change. So thinking about the people who are actually using the new tool to taking them on that journey, setting them up for success, and adoption change management bridges that gap between employees' current ways of working and the new vision that we have for using these tools in the future. So we have to understand how people work today so we can enable and equip them for the future. And so with ACM, we prepare, we equip, and we support people in a, adopting uh, change the digital change in pursuing those organizational objectives. So when you think about things at your organization level, when you have th that vision, that mission, those goals, what are your 2024 objectives? Um, leveraging adoption change management to help meet those goals um, really helps you realize those benefits and meet those, uh, those objectives. And so when we think about projects that have fine, fair adoption change management, those are three times more likely to meet those business objectives than those with poor adoption change management. I'm sure we've all experienced projects where maybe there wasn't the best adoption change management and people are asking questions like, why are we doing this? What's happening? Feeling frustrated. Maybe your calls to the service desk goes uh, go up and so you're actually spending more money because you made this change and didn't invest in adoption change management. So when we think about those projects with excellent ACM or adoption change management, they're seven times more likely to meet those business objectives, which is awesome. That's what we're looking for here. And so when we think about the value of change management, projects with excellent change management initiatives, like I said, are seven times more likely to achieve those project objectives. Um, and then we, when we think about it, they're 4.6 times more likely to stay on or ahead of schedule. So if, again, we're thinking about how Copilot can help us be more efficient, merging that with an approach and adoption change management, your efficiency just goes, it blows the roof off. And then if you think about on uh, the importance of staying on time or on budget, um, projects with adoption change management, strong adoption change management are 1.4 times more likely to stay on or under budget. 
So when we think about that overall investment into Copilot, staying under budget is really critical to the organization because you are making an upfront investment, both in licensing and that people cost around um, implementation and adoption change management. So um, the more you can invest in that to get the people enabled to be able to be successful with a tool you're spending a fair amount on um, is really, really important. And these hard numbers that we're looking at are from ProSci benchmark studies. Now, ProSci is our foundational um, adoption change management methodology. It's kind of like the gold standard of adoption change management. And they do a lot of quantitative and qualitative research around change management. Now, we have these hard numbers here. There are a lot, uh, there are other softer aspects that inform these numbers. So it is it is sometimes hard to quantify sentiment, um, but excellent change management helps manage expectations, helps manage results, and address concerns with changing technology. So um, I'm sure we've all experienced when you're, maybe you have a bank app and all of a sudden they move stuff around. You're like, what happened to my money? Why can't I use this anymore? And you get really stressed out. Ultimately, we don't want that to happen. And especially in the workplace because um, people's, uh, view of the organization, their satisfaction, their productivity goes down. So with excellent change management, that means that it's thorough, it's planned, it's leading to on-time delivery. And with excellent change management, it, pre it prevents the having to go back and redo the project, replanning, retraining, redoing it all. Um, and then you end up spending a lot more money if you don't have good change management. So yes, you can flip a switch to turn something on, something like Copilot on, but when you take time to really understand your goals, plan and achieve those goals, and have an adoption methodology and approach along the way that's um, planned, consistent, um, invested in, you're already on track to see more success and see that return on investment um, for co-pilot or any other project. So as you can tell, I'm super passionate about adoption change management. Sometimes I have seen that it's one of those things that gets cut out of the budget of a project and then people end up having to go back and redo that work. And if, if you're coming from a place of positivity, people are more likely to be excited. If you've already done something poorly, it's really hard to get people from a super negative place into a super positive place. If you have questions, uh, well, we should have time at the end to dive deeper if you have any additional questions. Now, when it comes to co-pilot for M365 adoption, um, there are four key challenges that we're seeing with working with co-pilot adoption in our customers. So first, technical readiness. Um, is my technology ready? Is it secure? Is it compliant? So making sure that the system under the hood where the sausage gets made is all ready to go secure and compliant. Next, storytelling around AI. How does my organization feel about generative AI tools? Um, are you getting support from the leadership? Are you getting support from boots on the ground? How do we want to communicate about AI? Are we already communicating about a generative AI? Are people excited? Are they anxious? Kind of what's the feeling and how do we want to wrap around the storytelling there? And user adoption. How do I prepare my employees to use Copilot effectively? How do I equip them with the right tools? How do I equip them with the right learning? Um, and then once they're using it or maybe somewhat using it, how do I sustain that innovation? So thinking about how do we continue to discover, innovate, and build with Copilot um, and not just launch something, give them resources, give them a 30-minute training, and, and hope that it'll go well and drive innovation. You really have to have a sustainment model for what that looks like. Now, our approach, like I said, is rooted in ProSci, um, and we have a quantitative and qualitative approach to people and change. Obviously, we'd love to work with everyone uh, to help them with their success in uh, Copilot or anything else. However, if you're doing this on your own, if you're out there without the support of Valorum Reply, here are some key approaches that you can um, lean on and take with you to support in your success. 
So first is thinking about the campaign and training. So we'll dive deeper into each of these uh, these different uh, pillars of success. Uh, but when we think about campaign and training, this is all about driving excitement, getting people that hands on training, gathering feedback and creating a, a space for continued learning. Next, we want to make sure that we're building a champions network. So we want to have a group of people who are excited, who are across the organization and can share feedback and boost the benefits of the new tool. So think about like TikTok, Instagram influencers in your organization out there hitting the ground, getting people excited um, and influencing uh, a behavior change. And then finally, making sure that you are measuring your success. How are you going to measure your ROI or return on investment? Um, utilizing the champions group to identify those high value use cases and then build it all into your unique co-pilot use case. Now I'm going to hand it over to Caitlin uh, to talk more about these pillars. So take it away, Caitlin. Great. Thank you so much, Margaret. Yes, so let's go ahead and dive into that first pillar. So creating an engagement camp and training campaign that really sets users up for success. The first aspect of this is really managing the message. We know that there are a ton of anxieties or maybe even myths out there floating around about AI, uh, ideas that maybe it's so efficient that it'll replace your job or replace you, or on the flip side, ideas that it's so inefficient that it'll actually take more time to review outputs or correct mistakes. But all of those ideas or myths kind of come from common fears that technology is going to fundamentally change your ways of working, which of course it will, right? But we want to navigate this space as an exciting form of change and transformation. So demonstrating and driving that excitement with what could be possible and what can happen is really critical. We often see um, great ways of demonstrating value through specific use cases that really kind of drives home the value for individuals. And we want to make sure that we are driving this art of the possible, right? What can you do? Um, not everything in every message has to be here is how you use it all of the time. It's about encouraging exploration. So we want to again demonstrate then value, uh, demonstrate value and showcase where to start. Um, you know, the amazing thing about AI and the amazing thing about Copilot is that it is continuously improving. So something that you tell someone one day um, and say, oh, I haven't had that experience yet, but continue to try it. We know that day in, day out, that uh, that functionality is improving and that it can do more every single day. So demonstrating and the value and showcasing where people can start busting those myths and encouraging that exploration. Again, making sure that people understand that AI is ultimately a tool, an assistant. It's not a replacement for us. It's a replacement for those mundane tasks that eat away our day. Um, and it's a way to give you more time. So we wanna make sure that this messaging and we're managing it to make sure that those, those are very clearly and thoroughly stated. And of course, again, setting realistic expectations of use. Um, there are some things that Copilot simply can't do. Uh, and so we want to make sure that when people are going and trying and seeing kind of what's available, that they also don't get disheartened because there is a very specific task out there that they need assistance with. Maybe Copilot's functionality isn't quite there yet. What we don't want them going is saying, oh, well, it can't do that. So I'm not going to use it anymore. We want to make sure we're setting a realistic expectation to then leverage and say, what else can we do beyond that? And one of the ways to kind of focus this messaging then is to frame the value of Copilot around the issues that your employees are currently facing. So the first issue that we see all the time is this idea of the broken meeting. Uh, if you're anything like us, you are overbooked in meetings, but then the problem is we miss critical information when we don't attend. And then additionally, so much information is happening during a meeting that it's super difficult to take notes and pay attention at the same time. So uh, we have this problem where there's too much happening in meetings and we're not really getting our headspace around it. 
The second problem that users are facing is this idea of an information labyrinth. So in the same way that there's too much information in meetings, there's also just too much information everywhere, right? There are too many methods of communication. People aren't really sure which tool to use when. So there's different chat messages, there's different files in places, there's different channel posts, and people end up spending far too much time searching for their information as opposed to getting their job done. And studies have shown that a heavy email user will spend 8.8 .8 hours per week on emails. So kind of going back to what Margaret was talking about earlier about framing that value and that cost benefit, right? If you take, you know, one day of work every single week to do a task that Copilot can help, it immediately frames that cost and puts that into perspective for you. And then finally, the last issue we have that we see with um, our workers is the blank page. So we saw earlier, 57% of employees are spending their time in meetings as opposed to creating. But then when they do have the time to create, they don't have the headspace because they spent their entire day in meetings. So if you are context switching and bouncing between tasks, there really isn't enough time to do the work that matters. And we need sort of the rest to be able to do the work that drives the passion. So when we focus our message and we frame Copilot's value around helping solve for some of these modern digital workplace issues, we immediately frame Copilot as a value add as opposed to a tricky new tool or technology. So then on the other side of the communication coin, we have training, which obviously has to go hand in hand with a tool like Copilot. And training for an evolving tool can be really difficult. You cannot stay on top of each and every update, but what you can do is create a culture of knowledge and curiosity. So again, you start the communication by saying, here's how Copilot can start to add value, and then you leverage a space where people can continue to knowledge share and drive that sustainable learning. We also want to make sure that we're training for both the role and the tool. Copilot for Microsoft 365 has almost so many use cases that it can be quite hard to narrow down each use cases per business unit, especially if your organization is quite large. So making sure that people understand how to use the tool across applications and then, you know, pairing that with this is how you use it for your specific business unit. This is where we've seen high value use cases. Sort of that combination is really what we wanna see. We also want to make sure that we're creating a space and a knowledge hub for users to share testimonials, questions, and especially really fun results. Um, that helps lead to organic discovery to accompany really a more formal training engagement. And of course, we want to make sure we're gathering critical feedback and we are iterating for a larger audience. So if you're starting off with a pilot, you're starting off with a smaller business unit, you're making sure that kind of we understand what worked, maybe what we can improve upon, and then go into the next larger group, the next business unit with that information. And again, because Copilot is a tool that is continually evolving and continually adapting, we want to make sure that our training is following suit and meeting the tool where it is. And so we talk about kind of training for the role and meeting the tool where it is. It's really important to understand who in your organization is going to be using Copilot. Everyone in an organization can leverage it. So it's key to, you know, work with a partner like us to conduct things like in-depth discovery, identifying these high value use cases and personas when developing these campaigns and trainings. You know, someone who uses PowerPoint every day might not actually find as much value with Copilot in that particular application, but someone who doesn't know Excel formulas may find exceptional value there. So you may think that someone spending a lot of their time in a particular app means that is where we want to go, but actually it can kind of be the opposite. So we need to make sure we're taking our time to do this sort of discovery and identify our personas and our use cases, because that is the way we're going to be able to drive success. That is a lot about campaigns and training. I'm going to go ahead and pass it back to Margaret to go talk to us a little bit more about building your champion network. Awesome. So 
We know we heard about training and campaigns. Next, we want to think about building your champion, um, your champion network. So in this second uh, pillar of success, this is focusing on the people who can drive the enablement beyond that campaign and training. So when we think about a co-pilot change network, First, we want to understand what is a change network. So it's really important to identify critical players or champions who can fill this role as early adopters and liaisons and making sure that the right people are in this network is critical. So who should be in there? A, a change network is made up of connected, influential and representative uh, champions within an organization. So they are used to promote and support adoption through the change champion's personal influence. They serve as liaisons between the project team and the end user audience. And they are people who are excited about learning new things, getting early adoption access, um, and are excited about new solutions like Copilot. And they will provide a channel for two-way communications and act as the voice of the change um, to the people that they're connected with on their team. So when we think about who should be a change uh, champion within a change network, think about people who have a broad reach within a team. Think about people who are excited, who have a um, for lack of a better way of saying it, political capital with people, that people will hear the message from them, understand it, trust them, and also get excited about adopting something new and changing their behavior. So why should you have a change network? So um, oftentimes, again, uh, this is one of those things that people are like, ah, why should I invest in this? And it, it really is important because it touches upon not just the campaign, not just the communications, not just the, the training. It really puts those boots on the ground to drive the change at the individual level. So um, if I hear something from my boss, yeah, absolutely, I'm going to feel like I have to do it. But if I hear something from a colleague that I trust, I'm going to not only know that I have to do it because I heard it from my boss, but I might be more excited about doing it and it doesn't feel like a mandate, it feels like an opportunity. It also um, allows people to disseminate accurate information to peers about the new tool coming out. It establishes a community of knowledge um, of change advocates. So people who are out there who know what's going on, people that um, folks on the team can refer to um, and say like, yeah, great. I know I can go to Caitlin. Caitlin's a change champion. Caitlin's going to know what's going on with Copilot and I trust Caitlin. Um, it also reduces that top-down communication and encourages bottom-up communication in a two-way dialogue. So you're not just hearing it from your boss. You're not just hearing it from a faceless email. You're not just hearing it from the CEO. You're hearing it from someone you actually really trust and you know. Um, and Change Champions provide support to the project team and end users during launch. So when we think about that two-way dialogue, that two-way dialogue does happen between the people, but it also happens between the project and the champions. So they might be hearing pushback or they might be hearing, yeah, that message was great or I'm excited or I'm not excited. So it really kind of breaks that top down communication system and enables um, change and influence across the organization to touch and meet people where they're at. Now, when we think about change champions and what their expectations might be, um, every project is a little bit different, but this is a snapshot into what you what a change champion can expect in their role. So first, they need to understand what's happening. They need to understand why it's happening, and they need to understand how to communicate the change to people they're connected with. Um, change champions will also engage and support um, their team. So if I'm a change champion from the technology team, I'm going to go back and talk to um, folks on the technology team. I'm going to uh, relay messages to the CIO. I'm going to talk to the leadership team. Um, and then I'm going to talk to, you know, 
an analyst and and just people in the organization to make sure they're engaged and they know that I'm there as a as a role model and to support them. Change champions are also going to kind of get a pulse check of of uh, how my, um, how the adoption is going across the team, um, and they might even identify or escalate pain points around. Uh, yeah, people really aren't getting this, or um, here's some pushback that I'm hearing, or here's some concern. Um, one thing when it comes to copilot that sometimes people in the beginning might say is, I'm afraid of generative AI, and I'm afraid it's going to replace my job. And so um, one of the messages we might give to the change champions is like that is absolutely not the case. It's really here to help you do your job better so you can be more successful and free up time, spend less time teching and more time doing your job. Um, and change champions can also support with uh, the resolution of any of those pain points. And then they're also expected to maintain that strong network. So you um, you know, as a change champion, you wouldn't want to go and like blow up your relationship with everybody on your team and start being a jerk, right? You don't want that. You want to maintain a strong network um, and maintain connection across the organization. And so when we think about now that we know the expectations, we know what it takes to build a change champion, why you need that network, here are some sample activities for uh, champions. So when you think about um, four champions, our objective for the champions is to inform and empower them um, with engagement and build a framework for post-engagement success. So we might have specific trainings for them. We might have specific project meetings and syncs with them to make sure that they're up to date about what's happening. Um, we always like to have a dedicated uh, champions community to foster conversations between champions and get them the messages that they need right away. Um, and we might even provide them with resources like meetings in a box. So what they can do to take back to their team, giving them resources so they're not building stuff that, um, you know, we're equipping them with that. And then we might enable them through one-on-one -on -one coaching or other um, activities to make sure that they actually know what's happening, they know how to use the new tool, um, and that they're set up for success. And so, so some those are some things that we would do for champions and um, sample activities that might be done by champions is champions might monitor uh, questions around the change in technology. They might uh, support um, in in training sessions. Maybe they're leading them or um, where we are leading them, but then they're supporting with answering questions. We um, often like to uh, spotlight success stories from champions, so making sure that they're building excitement, we're shedding a light on what they're doing. Um, we often, like I said, like to have um, champions lead office hours, but if they're not comfortable or not ready to do that, we'll do that, but then they'll also be there to um, help promote those sessions and um, get the word out. And so um, there are, you know, it's a symbiotic relationship between um, us and champions, and we try to make sure that we're equipping them to tell that story across the organization and um, help with adoption across the board. Caitlin, I'm going to hand Thanks. it back to you. Great. Thank you so much, Margaret. Thanks for telling us all about those champions. So now that we know uh, how we are leveraging our campaigns and training, now that we know that we are bringing in a group of influencers, uh, TikTok or workplace, um, we are ready to then start talking about how we measure success, our final pillar. So this is often a factor of change management that is sometimes overlooked at the beginning, but is actually really critical, especially for an evolving tool like Copilot. So when we think about the criteria for a successful rollout, it's really important to understand that there are multiple levels to success. So obviously the first one, identifying those processes where Copilot could have an impact to help you navigate that sort of campaigning, those training and those messaging. Understanding that users feeling empowered to effectively use Copilot where appropriate, knowing that they have the correct training underneath them so that they are ready to go out on their own. 
identifying a business case, right, to recommend how your company is going to continue to move forward with AI, with additional licensing of Copilot. This could be a really effective measure of criteria, uh, in fact, you know, measurement of success when it comes to moving from a pilot to a larger rollout is being able to create that business case. Making sure that users understand the bounds of the tool, right? So again, managing that message, those expectations, but also the expectations of responsible use within their organization, um, and then making sure that they feel that they are advocates for that use. We also want to make sure we are managing the perception overall of Copilot and AI in the workplace. So not only just sort of the bounds of the tool, but as it continues to progress and how we need to sort of work together with it. And finally, a comprehensively measured um, at the impact and the return on investment. And what we really want to focus on is this particular success criteria, measuring that return on impact and that impact, because that is going, the return on investment in the impact, because that is going to really tell a story in a way that sometimes um, some of these other soft metrics um, aren't as effective at detailing. So, how do we measure success, right? Uh, there's a lot more than just numbers. It's a really a holistic picture. Um, some of the hard numbers that we talk about with ACM, those can come into play in terms of the, the cost analysis breakdown. But in order to create this entire picture, we really need to make sure we're leveraging three actions here. So the first is to leverage sentiment analysis. That's where we understand how effective our, our messaging was, right? So understanding through feedback forms, user surveys, ensuring that uh, users have growing trust of the tool and the technology that sometimes the numbers can start to show us, but don't necessarily give us the, that hard data in terms of feedback like that. Secondly, we have our Copilot adoption dashboard. So this is the new adoption dashboard um, through the Power of Viva Insights that's going to help put the numbers to the sentiment, telling that more holistic story, seeing where users are growing in their adoption, their usage, and maybe helping identify the pain points that they might have identified in the feedback forms. And then finally, we have AB user testing. So uh, make sure we want to identify and map key processes to understand where Copilot can help automate, speed up, or improve the task or process. So by combining these uh, success measurements, we are able to get a whole picture of how Copilot's being used, the frequency it is being used, and its user perception. And from there, we can really go and measure that impact really comprehensively. So when it comes to leveraging something like A-B testing, it is really, really important when we start to have a clear vision of what metrics we want um, to justify an additional investment of Copilot, especially if we're starting with a pilot and then moving on to a larger organizational rollout. It's also a, a way to identify the highest value use cases within a specific organization, because as we mentioned before, each business unit is going to use and interact with Copilot for M365 a little bit differently. But um, through early identification of metrics, you can leverage quality A-B testing. So the first, we want to make sure we are identifying a specific number of users that we're going to be measuring. Um, we don't want just groups like a certain department, a couple of business units. We want to make sure when we're going for some, some of these hard numbers in this AB user testing, we know exactly the number of users involved. We then want to make sure we're understanding their frequency of usage. So when we talk about A-B testing, identifying a specific use case, splitting them up, and then seeing the frequency of that use case. Then we're going to analyze the time saved. So we have the number of users, we have the use case, how often it happens, and then we can move into the time saved. This group used Copilot, this group used traditional ways of working, and now we can take that hard number of those minutes or hours saved. We then understand the quality of the output, right? So. There's something to be said for if, you know, Copilot is is not um, quite there in its functionality or it's not perfect for the task at hand. Is it actually producing a less effective version of what you need, right? Because then at that point, maybe that's not the most high value use case. Maybe we need to see where Copilot can speed up other tasks or that it does a certain part of a task. We want to make sure that when we are leveraging AI, our quality as an organization, as a business unit is still at the top. 
And then we want to look at user satisfaction. So people who have used Copilot, how happy are they with it? How much time it saved, the quality of it, how satisfied? And then also understanding the satisfaction level and the quality and the time spent for users who weren't using Copilot on that journey. So by identifying our goals and metrics, taking our users through this A-B testing, we can then see sort of the more holistic picture of the value of Copilot. One of the other measurements I want to make sure we talk about is our co-pilot adoption dashboard. So again, this is coming to you through the power of Viva Insights to help you drill down into usage and activity per application. So here we can see from this home screen, um, you can see and review the active licensed users per M365 application. So this is a great drill down into seeing who has the license, who's using it, and maybe more importantly, who's not using it. We can also see the user count per action taken. So whether you are creating, whether you are summarizing, whether you are drafting, um, we can understand the best use cases by looking at these numbers, drilling them down into their application, and then drilling them down further into the type of prompt that's being given. And then from there, we can adjust campaigns and training to increase usage and maybe some of the lower numbers. So if maybe we're not seeing a ton of usage within PowerPoint, we can go back and do that iterative approach where we go and we say, hey, maybe people aren't understanding fully how to use it. So let's go back, making sure we're cultivating that, that knowledge center, making sure that our champions are able to take that message and adjust those pain points and help drive that usage. And we can watch those numbers increase through the dashboard. So what did we talk about here, right? So the, the three um, pillars to adoption success, the first one being that we're talking about campaigning and training. So the messaging, managing that message to drive excitement over concern, making sure that our training is hands-on to gather feedback, and then making sure that we have created a hub or a space for continued learning and knowledge sharing. And then we've looked to building a champion network. So making sure that we have passionate champions who can reach across the organization and across roles, making sure that they know that they are part of a community. It's a safe space to share feedback and to help the project team. And then of course we have the incentive, right? So there's benefits to being a champion. There's, there's more than just, I am a cool influencer. There's year end sort of project review and, and, and professional development review. Sometimes there's things like badges. There's lots of interactive ways to showcase how cool it is to be a champion of a new technology. And then we've got our measuring success. So we're thinking about our ROI, plan early, plan often. We wanna make sure that we have the metrics we want to hit. And as we're going through the project, we can ensure how we're hitting them at every turn. And then of course, using your community, right? So leveraging your champion group, identifying high value use cases, and then taking those use cases to do A-B testing, to review that adoption dashboard, to overall build a co-pilot business case for your organization. And I'll go ahead and pass it back to Margaret to talk a little bit more about this. Awesome, thanks Caitlin. So now that we know the foundational pillars of success when it comes to Copilot, how do you get started rolling out Copilot? Well, first, we, no matter where you are in your Copilot journey, you can always, always, always reach out to us to help you take that next step. So whether it's that you need a foundational understanding of Copilot, um, how to inform your organization or tailor messages, et cetera, we are here to help you. So uh, this is just a quick snapshot into some of the Copilot offerings that we have. Um, thinking about leadership enablement and art of the possible, thinking about technical readiness and enablement, um, pulling together a pilot or a full-blown adoption change management campaign um, around Copilot. We're here to help. Um, we can absolutely support you along your technology journey. So uh, we know that there's lots going on. Microsoft has recently announced some changes to Copilot availability. So that means that organizations can purchase fewer than 300 licenses to get started. Um, in the past, it, there was a 300 minimum. So now um, I think it's, 
between 100 and 299 licenses. Um, so this could be a great opportunity to start having those enablement conversations if you haven't started having them, and we can work together on what a pilot could look like for your organization. Now, when it comes to our experience with Copilot, um, it's not just all theoretical. We have lots of experience rolling out Copilot, even though it's a relatively new tool. Um, we've been working in the uh, early adopters program um, and have been engaging with other organizations across the board to roll out uh, Copilot. So in this example here, we're looking at a telecommunications organization um, and they wanted to make sure that they were agile. They wanted a quick rollout that maximized adoption. So um, uh, we were super focused on um, telling the story of art of the possible um, and creating an engaging uh, campaign and having training material with a dedicated champions network and uh, are continuing to iterate and measuring success there. And so if there are any gaps, we'll take a look at the uh, insights dashboard and then, um, you know, iterate and, and uh, revamp our approach um, in a way that feels cohesive and doesn't feel like it's a brand new campaign. Um, and so people get change fatigue there. So lots going on with Copilot. Uh, as always, we're here to help. So please, please, please reach out. Um, and just to wrap up, uh, kind of complimenting what Caitlin was saying earlier, what did we talk about? We talked about those three pillars. We also, um, talked about lots. So I'm going to hand it over to Caitlin uh, to close us out and, and wrap up what, what we discussed. Great. Thank you so much, Margaret. So yeah, exactly. We talked about Copilot, what it is, how it's interacting with your system. Uh, you know, Margaret walked us through the value of investing in uh, comprehensive adoption change management, especially when it comes to a tool like Copilot. And then our tried and true sort of methodology, the key adoption pillars that we've seen help drive success. And then of course, Margaret walked us through how we can help you get started today. So looking at the Q&A, um, I don't see any new questions come in, but do have a couple that I'd love to call out for the larger group. First one coming in from Seth asking about the Copilot Adoption Dashboard being available in the M365 Admin Center. Um, we do see that it is available, but your M365 Admin needs to enable it. So once that's enabled, it is available via Insights. So that insights.cloud.microsoft um, address there. And then yes, this presentation will be available to you. The recording will also be available shortly. We'll get this uh, uh, taken down and then uploaded back into the uh, into our uh, site and our YouTube channel. So we will have these materials available. But I don't see any other questions, so I'll go ahead and just kind of take us to our next steps here. Um, of course. You can always reach out to us as well if you saw anything on this presentation that you thought was particularly interesting, you want more information about, we are here to help. So reach out to us at any point in time. Um, our email addresses are listed here. We also, again, have that um, fourth webinar in our series, fourth and final, um, about extending Microsoft uh, Copilot. So talking about how we bring in graph connectors, how we bring in um, plugins to continue to exponentially drive the value of Copilot. We're very, very excited to show you what we've been able to do internally and really what's out there and you know help you identify where you can uh, wh where you can drive that value. So again, although we have this webinar coming up, we're here. We love talking about Copilot. We are absolute enthusiasts, and we would love to talk to you about getting started today. So thank you all so very much for attending. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your Thursday. As always, we are here to support you, and I hope you have a great day. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, everyone.